couple minutes to get people a chance to log on and then we'll get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone, again, and welcome to the latest installment of our Homeroom with Education Leaders webinar series. Uh, today's conversation in partnership with Lake Research Partners is focused on our Across the Aisle initiative, parent and voter priorities one year from the ESSER deadline. Uh, my name is Lucy Barrier Matheson. I am Deputy Director of K-12 here at the Hunt Institute. Uh, and for those unfamiliar with us, uh, we were founded by four-term North Carolina Governor Jim Hunt, and we serve as a resource for policymakers and education leaders on issues across the spectrum from early childhood to K-12 to higher ed uh, through in-person and virtual convenings, research, and other forms of technical assistance. Uh, before getting the conversation started, I'd just like to provide a brief logistical overview. Uh, we will start off with a brief presentation uh, highlighting this year's survey and the results, and then we will transition to a moderated discussion with our panelists. Um, and then after that, as time allows, we will have opportunity for Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the discussion, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit those. Uh, and again, if we have time, we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, but we definitely want to kind of hear your thoughts and questions throughout. Um, we will, are also recording this conversation, and in the next couple of days, it will be posted on our YouTube channel, um, so you can access it to watch again or share with others. Uh, definitely, we also encourage you to join us on Twitter. Uh, we are live tweeting from our Twitter account, which is at Hunt underscore Institute, and you can also participate in that conversation using the hashtag EdHomeroom. And speaking of today's conversation, we are so appreciative of the panelists who are joining us today to discuss across the aisle, parent and voter priorities for education and how these priorities can be leveraged before the ESSER deadline just a year away. In the fall of 2021, um, in partnership with Governor Bob Wise, we began working with Lake Research Partners to conduct a nation nationwide survey of voters and parents on the challenges they faced participating in our education system and priorities for state and local leaders as they transitioned into the new normal. From those initial, initial conversations, which we uh, named the COVID constituency, uh, we learned that topics like learning loss, the digital divide, whole child education, and workforce training were top of mind for voters across the country. And a year later, in an effort to expand this work beyond the context of COVID, uh, we rebranded and saw this as an opportunity to reach across the aisle to find common ground on educational issues. Uh, our newly named Across the Aisle Bridging the Education Divide survey found that learning loss continued to be a concern among parents and voters. Um, and additionally, we discovered emerging concerns, um, including school safety and student mental health. Now in 2023, we are pleased to announce the findings of this year's Across the Aisle survey. And we are eager to dive deeper into how these priorities will impact district and state spending, upcoming elections and more. Um, also, as a note, we do have slides that will be shared. We will make those available in the next couple of weeks. We are working on getting the full report uh, in, a, in a place that to be shared. And so this is really a preview of those findings, but we will have them available to you through our website and we'll let you know uh, when that has been posted. Uh, but to dive into our conversation, I am thrilled to announce that we are joined by former West Virginia Governor and Congressman Bob Wise, who is our close partner and leader of our Across the Aisle initiative. 
uh, Charlene Russell Tucker, who is Commissioner of Education for Connecticut. And finally, Celinda Lake is the president of Lake Research Partners, a national public opinion and political research strategy firm, and also our partner in this work. Um, we are so grateful for all, to all of you for joining us. And with that, Celinda, I will turn it over to you to share some of our top line findings from our most recent survey. Well, thank you so much and absolutely delighted to be here and to continue this partnership and uh, love working with the commissioner and with the governor. Um, I also want to acknowledge on this call is Jesse Klein, who is uh, our lead analyst on this work, and Alicia Snell, who is another partner in the firm who has been the leader of this team for some time. And we are very excited about the resources that the Hunt Institute has put in to really understand what the mood of the public is and to keep this data updated in real time. So if we look at um, the next slide, you can see the methodology here. This is hot off the presses, July 18th to 25. It's a very, very robust sample. Uh, 1,300 people, likely 2024 voters, 800 people overall, then appropriate sampling. So we can look at the subgroups of African-Americans, Asian-American, Pacific Islanders, Latinos, and Native American likely voters and then likely voters of parents of school-aged children. So all of the numbers that you will see quite robust. The overall error is plus or minus 2.7%. So let's go see what we found. The top takeaways are voters and parents alike have a very clear vision of their priorities for education, public schools, both nationwide and in their communities. And it's often quite different uh, from what either side is talking about. Voters and parents see a major role, in fact, the number one role for teachers in determining curriculum and what is taught in the classroom. They also see a major role for parents of school-aged children and think a partnership between the teachers and the parents is very, very powerful and what should be happening. As Lucy said, voters' top priority for education today reflect very much a post-COVID uh, perspective and the post-COVID agenda teaching real world skills for the future workforce, ensuring public schools are free of guns and other physical violence, students not reading at grade level, ensuring public schools are free of bullying, including cyberbullying, and ensuring access to mental health services for students and their families. Those are the most popular priorities. They are also related to the most popular education proposals which is increasing job skills, teaching critical skills, training educators and other personnel to identify warning signs and intervention techniques and mental health. And the gen, uh, the millennials and the Gen Zers have really brought the mental health agenda to the table for education and everything else. Proposals to provide students with online safety education, literacy programs, equitable access to early childhood education, and training for school safety officers round out the top tier. And you can see there are some things that reflect what's in the headlines. There are some things that reflect the post COVID agenda. And there are some things that tie very readily to the economic challenges that voters and parents feel we're facing. Looking at the data, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in terms of the other summary, people think the same things help students move forward that they're for after school programs in summer. They're not so eager to make the school day longer, but they are very eager to have after school and summer learning opportunities. Additional counseling or social and emotional learning and mental health support. This has become quite a controversy in some school boards. It is not a controversy with the public and particularly social and emotional learning when explained or linked to mental health, very, very popular. Individualized learning, which still people think our kids have a long way to catch up and connecting families to community-based support services and resources. One thing that is much more controversial is only half of voters nationwide support using public tax dollars for school vouchers. They are committed to public schools, but they love the idea of public taxpayer dollars for education savings accounts. And there is strong messaging for public officials or education leaders 
the strongest message we tested revolves around the agenda and the orientation we've already discussed. Quote, we must equip every school with resources necessary to deliver quality education that prepares every child for the future, no matter who they are, what they look like, or where they come from. Nine in 10 voters say they are likely to support someone who says we must equip every school with the resources necessary to deliver quality education that prepares every child for the future, no matter their color, their background, or their zip code. So people are very, very committed to all children here and parents and all voters share this commitment. Let's go look at some of the data that led us to draw some of these conclusions. So first we have on the right, thinking of public funding in your state, and then on, I'm sorry, on the left, and then on the right, we have thinking of public schooling in funding in your community. You think there's too much, too little, or about the right amount. Everyone thinks, uh, a majority think in their communities or in their state that there is too little. 52% in 2022, 45% in 2021, and 45% uh, today. In the community, around 40% in 2022 and 2021 thought there was too little, and today about 38%, with the bulk of people, um, the other half of people thinking mostly that there's about the right amount. No one thinks that there's too much funding for public education right now. The people that are most committed that there is too little funding tend to be uh, women, mothers, African-American voters, Native and Indigenous voters, Democrats and independents. If we look at the next state, current state of education and the job ratings that people get, and remember, this is at a time when all institutions are looking really, really poor to the voters. We just elected, or we just released data yesterday that showed the only institution that had positive ratings was the military right now. So high distrust, people thinking no one's getting the job done. People give teachers four-year colleges solidly positive ratings, 67, 65% positive ratings. K through 12 schools, teachers and other educators vocational and tech schools in their state, two-year colleges in their state, kindergarten schools and programs in their state, and K through 12 in their state, all getting almost half of voters. People are a little bit more um, questioning of K through 12 public schools in their state, and it obviously depends on the state. People that they think are not doing a great job, elected officials, K through 12 schools nationwide, and school board members whom they think of as having become very, very political at this point. If we look at the next slide, we ask people um, how much oversight, if any, should each of the following have on what's being taught in the K through 12 curriculum. And teachers, 85% say teachers should have a lot or some. 55% uh, say a lot. It's the number one entity that people think should have a say in the curriculum, followed by parents of school-aged children at 72 and 44. But notice the teachers are testing about 10 points better, and people really believe it should be a combination. School principals follow up the top tier at 74%. School boards, people think they should be involved but with much less intensity, half the intensity of teachers. And that's because people are having a little bit mixed feeling about school boards. Some people still love their school boards. Some people think they have become political battlegrounds. Taxpayers, mixed view on that. Only 25% saying a lot of input. A little bit of it, some input fine, but a lot no. People don't want politicians, even when we call them elected officials and elected leaders either at the local level or the national level involved in curriculum decisions. If we look at the next slide, you can see education priorities. And you can see there are two lines here. How big a problem do you think this is, which is the green numbers, and how uh, important do you think the issue is? You will notice that importance and problem follow each other with two exceptions insufficient school facilities and resources for children with disabilities. But in general, um, people's 
priorities, the problems follow the priorities. And this is the most intense voters. This is a very big problem. People have very differentiated judgments there. There's some things they think are a problem uh, circled at the top. And then there's some things they think are not a problem, either because they're not so clear about them or they simply don't support them or they don't think it's a problem. Number top problems, not teaching real world skills for the future workforce, ensuring public schools are free of guns and other physical violence, students not reading at grade level, followed very closely behind by ensuring public schools are free of bullying and book banning and curriculum censorship. People are opposed uh, to book banning and curriculum censorship. The things they think are most important, similarly, real world skills, free of guns, reading at grade level, and ending uh, bullying. At the bottom of the list are lack of diversity in education workforce. Uh, people aren't so clear what that means. They're much more familiar with lack of diversity in the workforce than they are in the education workforce. And they tend to think of the education workforce as fairly diverse. And then lack of public or private school choices. People do not think this is a problem and they don't think it's very important. And remember, they opposed public taxpayer dollars being used for vouchers, did support ESA accounts. So lots of things on voters' minds, but they are rank prioritizing them. And the things that people tend to think are the biggest problems are very high priorities to them. There are two high priorities that people don't think of as a huge problem right now. One is school facilities and classroom materials. They actually think that there was a lot of investment in that recently. And so they're very unaware that that investment was quite uneven. And then lack of support and resources for children with disabilities. They think it's very, very important actually in their top four, but they tend to think that there is a lot of help for families and children with disabilities now. Looking at how these um, priorities and problems translate into proposals, you will see voters have a very consistent and developed schema around schools. So what are their top proposals? What do they favor with the most intensity? Increasing job skills and workforce. 94% support that. That's virtually a value. It's not even a policy debate to the public. Every single demographic and political group wildly, wildly in favor of this and 72% strongly in favor. Teaching critical skills for the workplace as including problem solving, communication, teamwork and professional etiquette. People think that's overwhelmingly important. Older people think it's even more important than younger people. Train educators and other school personnel to identify warning signs and intervention techniques related to mental health. Mental health has really come onto the agenda. And as Lucy said, we saw this in the previous polling. I think it's a big problem. They're willing to invest in a lot of ways in it, social and emotional learning, mental health advisors, training people in early warning, providing uh, resources. Providing students with education about risks of online, uh, implementing evidence-based literacy programs, ensuring equity and access to high quality early education and training school safety officers for the unique environment of the school, including anti-bias, disability training and cultural awareness. We tend to share, stay away from some of this language and we think of it as being fairly controversial, actually far from the truth. All of these proposals are core values to voters actually and supported by real intensity by parents and non-parents. What do people think, rounding out the picture here, what do people think will be the most helpful to students moving forward? And remember the public overwhelmingly committed to helping all students. They're very inclusive in their education agenda. Offering after school and summer learning programs, additional counsel or social counseling or social and emotional mental health support. Notice we use that quoted under, dreaded word social and emotional, very popular with people individualized learning, connecting families to community-based support services and resources. All of those, again, core values, and all of them uh, by parents and non-parents thought to be very helpful by at least a majority of voters. People also pretty supportive of additional uh, time of the year schooling, an optional, optional additional year to cover 
uh, year of schooling to cover pandemic and longer school years. Although the longer stuff is getting more controversial, people feel much more mixed about additional school days over weekends or breaks. And they're very mixed. In fact, they net oppose longer school days, uh, particularly for younger children. They think uh, they can't take the longer day. So people are making differentiated judgments here. And you can see uh, where, um, where they merely mean it when they say this is important, it will be helpful and I support it because they are differentiating between some things that they think are less important and less helpful. So that is a very quick tour of the landscape. As Lucy said, all of you can get all of these slides and uh, access to the full data, which is a very rich data set. And let me turn it over uh, to Lucy to transition to the rest of the panel. Thank you so much. I continue to be fascinated with these results and how they show us truly where voters and parents' values lie and how that differs somewhat from how we're having these conversations in the public space. Uh, so very much appreciate that. Uh, Governor Wise, I will turn it to you. Um, would love to hear from you about the key takeaways that stood out to you from these results and how our state and local policymakers should be responding to these public priorities. Well, thank you. And I want to thank very much Celinda Lake and Lake Research Partners and always good to be back with you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, so. I have some quick takeaways as both a former politician, uh, former office holder, uh, and current ad education advocate. First of all, what I've been encouraged by, and this incidentally has been borne out through almost now three years, I believe, Celinda, of data that you've provided. What, what I'm encouraged by is, first of all, the public wants genuine focus on genuine education issues that deal with the educational outcomes of their children. Uh, that there are a lot of red meat issues out there. People feel about them as they feel about them. But the, what the public's really concerned about are the issues that Celinda is late, that late, that comes out in the data. And that includes teaching real world skills. That includes uh, ensuring that public schools are safe. And also that, uh, and one that I think is important is that students uh, are reading at grade level. Second thing that comes, this message that comes out for me loud and clear is the need to talk about partnership, partnership between parents, partnership with teachers particularly, uh, but then also the partnerships. And I know Commissioner uh, Russell Tucker is very much involved in this, the uh, uh, partnerships that um, uh, uh, with, with, with school districts uh, leadership uh, overall. Third is that uh, the, I'm very encouraged to see the public is saying they want quality education for all. So it's not just my child. Yes, they are concerned about their child. So let me suggest a way to talk about that. We want public quality public education for all that is individualized and meets each child where they are. And that meeting each child where they are uh, comes out very strongly in, in the Lake Research Poll. And finally, I do just want to mention early literacy, uh, which they think is important reading at grade level and that gets to teacher preparation, which the Hunt Institute has its another initiative path forward to work with uh, states in improving their teacher preparation programs that reflect this. But supporting the teacher uh, and the partnership piece of it just uh, comes out throughout this survey and that ought to be focused on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Russell Tucker, you joined us a year ago for a similar conversation around state priorities in the shadow of the upcoming ESSER deadline. Uh, during that conversation, you shared how your agency is leveraging parent and voter voices through your roundtable for family and community engagement and education. Uh, now we're one year out from that deadline to obligate ESSER dollars. Uh, what has been the impact of incorporating that kind of stakeholder voice into your agency's decision making? Well, Lucy, thank you so much. And I so appreciate being invited back uh, to join Governor Wise and Celinda uh, on this uh, really important topic and conversation. Uh, so thank you. You know, incorporating stakeholder voices into our decision-making process is essential for effective policymaking. And it is a key practice uh, in Connecticut. Effective solutions require teams of stakeholders, including policymakers or community uh, leaders or parents and families clearly our educators and also not to forget our students, their voices matter as well. And I always like to say it can't be about them without them. So three specific areas of impact for incorporating stakeholder voices here in Connecticut 
Number one, guiding our ESSER investments. We did a great job in reaching out to public, having public forums, survey data, and we captured a number of key themes uh, from our constituents. And it resulted in five investment priorities that guided the districts and also the state agency alike in terms of funding uh, and, and the priorities for what we needed to do uh, with the ESSER investments. Number two, the second impact is development of programs and initiatives to meet urgent needs. And as I listened to Celinda's report out of the survey, it's actually affirming in terms of where we are. Uh, we've continued those stakeholder input processes here and the urgency of action was clear. We must continue to address student and staff wellness, provide more social, emotional, mental, and physical health supports, address the staffing shortages. We do have that here in our state and focus on school attendance and re-engagement, specifically chronic, chronic absenteeism, which is a key, key factor in affecting our students' learning acceleration. And so it really helped to shape our year priorities, our 2023-2024 school year priorities, a year in Connecticut, which we're calling it, calling a year of infinite uh, possibilities. So in addition to those three things that I talk about, we're also focusing focused on elevating uh, curricula and framework, model curricula frameworks in our state, uh, providing, promoting data transparency, which I know we can talk about later as well, which is really so important, and expanding career pathways and workforce development initiatives, elevating and funding what works and cultivating strategic partnerships. I know the governor mentioned that as well. And the final impact of stakeholder engagement is shaping our policies and practices. You mentioned Lucy, our commissioner's round table, which I developed five years ago before sitting in the seat of commissioner, uh, bringing together family and community voices to inform programmatic priorities. Five years later, this round table is now codified in legislation in our state uh, with reports to the legislature required, signaling a really strong state commitment to collaboration and the elevation of stakeholder voice, regardless of who sits in this chair, it is now the law in, in the state for that group to be meeting together. So it's really important. And as I listened to the results from the survey, uh, again, I said it's reaffirming in where we are and reflects what we've heard in Connecticut as well and reinforce the priorities that we had and the priorities that we continue to undertake. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I will also note that we have shared several links in the chat uh, to provide more information on those initiatives. Um, so feel free to check those out. Um, Celinda, we will come back to you. Um, leading a national polling and political strategy research firm, you and Lake Research Partners, of course, have had your ear to the ground in terms of how constituents feel about our current education systems. Um, and in a little over a year, Americans will go to the polls on what feels like another unprecedented election. Uh, how do you foresee the issues that we have seen emerging in these results um, and other public surveys that y'all have conducted and you've seen uh, impacting that election? Is education going to be a key issue for voters like we saw um, last time around? So it used to be a long time ago, we had this conversation five or 10 years ago, we would have been saying, not really, uh, education is a state and local issue, more local than even state, and people don't really see a federal role. And uh, even when politicians do symbolic things like George Bush being committed to education, putting that uh, schoolhouse on the Department of Ed, people still thought it was a very narrow role. Things have really, really changed. Uh, and it's changed with everybody. It hasn't just changed with parents. It'll be important to remember that the 20, 24 electorate is likely to only have 28% of that electorate be parents and 29% of that electorate to be grandparents. So the majority of voters will, in fact, more than the majority, two thirds, will not have someone in public school. And yet what we've been seeing really since 2021, a solid majority of voters have been willing to vote in local and state elections and in federal elections to support efforts and make changes to our public education system. They want to know where their candidates stand on education. They've really been holding their governors and Governor Wise can speak to us responsible for education in their state. They also think, and economy is the number one issue, uh, people think that the education agenda is directly connected to the economy. And they think they're very concerned about the future for their children. 
and think that what's going on in schools today is going to have a really strong impact on the economy in the very near future and in for the long term as well. And I can't speak to how popular job skills and workforce training is with all voters, with parents, very, very strong in the Latino community. Uh, we talk about the volatility of Latinos. Latinos are really looking for people who are getting job skill training in schools. And some of this agenda uh, relates to national issues. You'll notice the high commitment to uh, gun sa to safety, broadly defined, including cybersecurity and getting uh, keeping guns free, is free, schools free of guns. We just did some polling in the AAPI community. Uh, it is their number one issue in the state of Virginia, which has elections, not next November, but this November, is getting guns out of schools. And, and they're very, very concerned about children being uh, injured or killed. They're very concerned about the safety trainings. They're very concerned about uh, the training that school safety officers have to understand bias and cultural differences. So I maintain, you know, you have that most important question and the economy and rising cost of living is gonna be the top issue. But I think education is very, very top of mind with voters. They are very responsive to hearing what presidents say, what vice presidents say, with senators, governors, and local elected officials. And uh, the way that the media often characterizes that agenda is one around parental rights and social issues and divisive issues. That is not, at the end of the day, what the public's agenda is. The public's agenda is much more investments in public education for every student and teachers having the resources they need. Um, everyone talks about the, one of the things I love about polling is conventional wisdom's wrong about 95% of the time, plus or minus 5%. So everyone says people don't want teachers involved in curriculum. They don't want them deciding what their kids are going to learn. They don't like teachers anymore. Well, the public doesn't know they're not supposed to like teachers and they like teachers and they think they're the number one expert. They wanna work as the governor said in partnership and they wanna have their voices heard as stakeholders as the commissioner said. Um, I think this will be a very top issue. And I think that um, much of the political debate right now is not even talking about the things that the public's focused on. Absolutely. Um, along those lines of trust, um, would love to ask all three of you a follow-up question before I do. Um, we'll remind everyone to please submit your questions for our panelists in the Q&A. Um, so we know that trust is a foundational part of maintaining any institution. Um, and we know that our survey results are showing strong trust in teachers, but not quite that same level of trust in public schools as an institution. Uh, how can we go about repairing that weakened sense of trust or maybe identifying the root causes um, of why respondents are saying they don't have that sense of trust? Um, and how can we restore confidence among voters, parents, and other key constituents? Um, Celinda would love for you to respond first, and then we'll go commissioner and then governor White. Sure. Um, so first of all, um, trying to sell trust to the American public right now is like trying to sell them a used car. Um, and uh, people are very, very distrusting of everything. So there is decline in trust, but the decline in trust is actually particularly toward the, the actors, like the teachers, the principals, has been much less than decline in trust for other institutions like the Supreme Court, which has plummeted, the Congress, which has plummeted bipartisanly, I might add. And that's before we even get to a shutdown. Uh, so in this year, trust is declining on everything. Um, it is foundational and ultimately reestablishing trust is very, very important. And some of the processes the commissioner talked about is essential to that. Um, it is also, you ha to have trust, you have to talk about the things that people care about and then deliver on those things, not just make uh, promises. I'll never forget the um, Children's Hospital that used to, the National Children's Hospital Association used to have a slogan, who's for kids and who's just kidding. And uh, that could be reiterated re today in the public's mind. The other thing that's really a little bit puzzling and I think something that we really wanna work on is 
at, we have seen in previous uh, years that people were more positive the K through 12 schools. And that decline, now they're still more positive in their own community than they, and the school their child goes to than in the national setting. It's the national ones, but you saw that drift down to the state numbers declining too. And we have some key audiences that are very much declining. Um, voters with lower household incomes, independents and Republicans, native and indigenous people, and voters in 2024 battleground states, which I think brings us to our last point. Some of this decline is, become this, is because this is becoming not a conversation that everybody would be united on. And by the way, you can't get numbers like that when you say across the aisle. You can't get numbers like that unless this is truly a bipartisan agenda. You don't get to 70 and 90% without a solid majority of everybody, just mathematically. But voters are seeing, particularly in the battleground states, this become a real political battle and they're very angry about that. It's, they don't want division and political battles anyway. And by the way, the investment agenda and message solidly beats um, the kind of divisive quote unquote wedge issue agenda. So people want to uh, focus on the things that really matter for their kids. They wanna to join together. They're committed, whether they're parents, grandparents, or just ordinary voters. Um, and I think it's very, very important uh, to get our conversation geared in that direction. Lots of times we are all are intimidated and we think, let's just keep our heads down low. And most people would rather go to the dentist than go to a school board meeting right now. Um, but we have to articulate the agenda because the people will be with us if we articulate this agenda. So let me turn it over to my colleagues. And so I, I will jump in, which is so important and everything. I totally support what you just mentioned, Selinda. You know, from his book, The Speed of Trust, The One Thing That Changes Everything, Franklin Covey states, and I'll, I'll quote, we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their behavior. And this is why one of the fastest ways to restore trust is to make and keep commitments, even very small commitments to ourselves and to others. I, Celinda so mentioned that a bit, and it is so true. And I speak to that commitment uh, that we have here. I mentioned it before to creating transparency. And so, as you've heard, transparency is a cornerstone of the work that we do here, and firmly believe in sharing how both our students and districts are performing, as well as the efficacy of the interventions that we've created using the resources that we have to ensure that collectively we're working together off the same set of metrics or baseline to address the actual needs of our students with the resources we have. And clearly that requires a lot of us to be working together. And I'll just illustrate for you, uh, in Connecticut, we released our assessment results just a few weeks ago. And the headline was Connecticut sees improvement in attendance and math and science scores. Uh, considerable work remains to get attendance and achievement to exceed pre-pandemic levels. Covey talks about telling the truth in a way that people can verify. Uh, and so this is one of the behaviors of high trust leaders. And so it's really important as we go forward, we engage in, and some of these conversations are certainly not easy, but that's a part of leadership. And that's a part of what we do in bringing folks together. We did a survey of over 5,000 families recently connected to our learner engagement and attendance program. And they said, families are telling us in Connecticut, that relationship matters, trust math matters, the two-way partnership matters. And so we have to work, I think, consistently to make sure we're hearing and we're also giving voice to those who may feel voiceless and feel as if they don't have agency. And so this is the kind of work, it's gotta be authentic and we've gotta take the time to, to really listen uh, and be supportive and un understanding of what it is that we're hearing. That is a piece, and I think it is key when we talk about building trust. And to a point that Selinda was making and the commissioner as well, trust is never built by folks ducking and staying inside. Trust is only built when, whether it's the plant manager coming outside the fence, the principal coming and engaging the district superintendent, uh, trust is the, the legislator uh, being willing to engage even if it's a seemingly a hostile town meeting. So trust is only built by people actually seeing others in action. I like that intentions versus behavior uh, by seeing others in action. 
So there are three actions that I think are important. One is uh, uh, I would suggest that I'm gonna come back to partnerships again and constantly looking at education as a partnership and how can we work together to improve education. Uh, that's a different message than let's go blow up the school board meeting with rhetoric and, and uh, vitriol and make it uh, 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 the kind of thing that nobody wants to go to. The second thing is uh, feedback. Uh, one of the things that comes out of this poll is that while there, while there's discussion about parents being included in the curriculum, what everyone agrees on is the importance of parental feedback. And so how are parents perceiving the education that their children are getting, how in, in the ability to communicate that with, with their officials, whether elected or whether school and district officials. And I, I also want to suggest a new word uh, to introduce into this is rather than in obviously necessary to do Democrat, Republican in a poll and look at that. And, but I'm going to go beyond bipartisan to nonpartisan because I think that a lot of folks are very willing and very willing to talk about education as a nonpartisan activity as opposed to a Republican activity or a Democratic activity. So, uh, but I just do also have to go back to this is not if, if you're an elected official, particularly if you're facing an election coming up, this is not a time to go bury yourself or go try and talk about um, uh, how things are going in Latvia. Uh, the, the, you need to be out there directly involved and there will be some slings and arrows, no doubt about it. And Commissioner, I suspect you've taken some now and then. There will be slings and arrows, but over time, people are gonna remember that th there's that glacier, that iceberg effect. 10% of the attention, or 90% of the attention is going to the 10% that's above water. But below that water, there's a very strong group of people, a vast majority that wants definite, significant education outcome improvement for their children. Absolutely. Um, thank all three of you for that. Uh, that's incredible. Um, so next question, something that really stands out to me in the results, and I think something that just kind of gets to the heart of being an elected official, um, is this kind of in a way conflict between some of the things that voters and parents are not indicating as priority, but in the kind of education research policy space, we know is really important for kids to succeed. Um, I think particularly around diverse education workforce and it not being really strong for parents and voters, but we know the most important in school factor for student success is the teacher and a diverse teacher workforce is incredibly important for our diverse student population. Um, so we'd love to hear from all three of you, anyone who would like to respond to this, um, how can policymakers and education leaders create this balance between what voters and parents are indicating are their priorities and what's important to them and what research tells us is important for student success? So I would take seriously what the voters and public are saying. And, and I don't see that much of a disconnect. What they're, they may be putting a lower, a lesser emphasis on some things that that research shows are important for educating, but they're also putting, I think the proper, and I spend a lot of time nowadays on the science of learning, they're, they're putting a lot of emphasis on things that we do know are important, personalized learning, individualized lesson plans, uh, focusing on, uh, uh, Celinda, I, my guess is if you had taken this poll five years ago, workforce skill development would not have been anywhere, would not have been at the top. Uh, by any means. Uh, actually, I remember when you were taking some polls for me a few years ago, uh, that just simply wasn't measuring. Today, it workforce skill development. And when you talk about workforce skill development and you talk about mental health, you are, and that's what the public's talking about, you are talking about social emotional learning, you're talking about uh, uh, neuroscience, you're talking about the things that we know are important for education. I also, second point is that once you start engaging with the public and the public's engaging back, we're in this partnership discussion about the issues that the public feels are important. It gets a lot easier then to bring in those issues that also we know are, that research is showing is important, uh, uh, such as the diversity among the education workforce. Uh, and, and to be talking about that, I, I'm a big believer if we can work together 25% of the time and we get something done, it then begins to be 50% of the time and soon we're able to engage and then get a lot more agreement than what we would have had if we just uh, uh, focused on a couple of issues and only focused on those. 
You know, I'll also add uh, to what the governor mentioned uh, as well. And I go back to the issue of data and transparency, making information, whether you want to call it data or just information publicly available that everyone can engage with at the Department of Education here. That's what we really try to do to make sure that that information, we have an EdSite data portal and we're creating more and more dashboards that's accessible. And we're not just doing that in a passive way, but we're literally, we've worked with families to understand how to interpret, how to get the information for my school, for my school district. What can I do to compare it to others? And we really try to do that so at least everyone is at the same place and space. So if there's legislation, there can be conversation with policymakers about why there's a need maybe to legislate a particular thing. If, if, if conversations are happening at the school district level or even the school level, it can be done from a place of there's information to share and everything is public and transparent and available. I think it's an opportunity for then the conversations to occur. One of the workshops we did for families on our data about our data is how is my school doing? Oh, how is my child doing in school? Right. So how do I use that information to help to drive the conversation? So if you go to a school board meeting or if you're having a conversation with a superintendent or a principal, you're doing it from a standpoint. I have the information to share. And so it really is an opportunity to come together. Uh, and that that really is key, I believe, uh, in moving us forward. Now, if I can add just three messaging things, too, by the way, first of all, we definitely need an education a campaign here. There was a time when people had no idea what social and emotional learning was. Now they're starting to know, and they really, um, and when you say mental health, it really clarifies it for them. There was a time when people had no idea, job skill training, wouldn't that occur at the employer? Or like, what would that look like? Um, but people are very aware of it. They can draw pictures of it. They can say whether their kid's in it or not. Uh, they can say whether their high school has it or not, or whether the Lust Bond Initiative just supported it or not. So we need an education campaign, including defining. People aren't opposed to this, by the way. They just think it already exists. Uh, they tend to, because first of all, the, the teacher workforce is much younger than the electorate. Uh, baby boomers are 72% white. Gen Zers are 48% people of color. So they just assume, what are you talking about? Young people are far more diverse. Young people are the teachers. Of course, it's diverse workforce. Well, what's the problem here? Um, that might have been a problem in my day. I think also we don't want to say it's either or. I mean, it's like you said, Governor, the voters are with us on 85% of the things. There's just one or two things that they're not, mainly not out of opposition, but out of uh, lack of awareness. And so we should say, and, you know, job skill, training, mental health, and. And then I think we should link it together. And I don't know, I'm not an education expert, but it seems to me to say, uh, you know, people are very worried about young men of color in particular. How are you going to reach young men of color if you don't have some teachers who are young men of color? I, I mean, and people love their school teacher that is a young man of color who's the kindergarten teacher. They just absolutely love that uh, or whatever. They think that's just fantastic for their girls and their boys. Um, so I think that we need to link these together. How do you have mental health? And how do you have early warning if you don't have someone that the kid sees themselves in or thinks comes from their community? Um, so again, I, I don't see this as, I see this as an education problem, not an opposition problem, which is really different. And I'll just I'll add to that as well. So imagine then with what you said, the power of being able to click on the website and look at your school and see the population of the students. And you can also see the population of the teaching staff. You can look at the gender of the teaching staff. And so that becomes a real conversation that is happening with information readily available. And it, it is the truth and the facts, right? That then bring you together for that real conversation. And then you overlay that cylinder with, okay, why is this important? And what does the research tell us? And frankly, then you can have conversation with the students themselves, right? At the appropriate age to talk about the value uh, of that, which, which we've done here as well. So it's, it's all of that working together. I, I agree it's not either or, it's both and. Perfect. Along those lines, we've talked a lot around the importance of engaging families, um, some ways that that has been successful. 
um, one of the things that we know is crucial to continue to engage families and communities around is learning acceleration. How are we supporting kids and the impact of COVID? Um, but we also know that the general public already has COVID fatigue. They don't really want to talk about it anymore. We've kind of we're in a we've moved on space. Um, so how can we continue to engage parents and families and communities in these conversations, knowing that this is going to be a long-term recovery, knowing that we're going to really be talking about this for a while? And we'll open that to anyone as well. Well, I can start. I don't know anything about the education dialogue, but I can talk about the public dialogue. First of all, um, people have COVID in their mind. It's not like people forgot it. They're tired of it. They, they want to move on. They want to move to the future. Also, the COVID dialogue tends to be a deficit dialogue. We lost this. We lost this. We lost this. What voters are responding to is an asset. Our kids need more individualized training. Our kids need to have literacy courses so they catch up in reading. Um, so we need to talk about the solution, not the problem. A friend of mine who is a cognitive linguist that many of you may know often says in her speeches, which I love, Martin Luther King didn't start out with a speech that said, I have a problem for you. He started his speech out with, I have a dream, I have a vision. Um, and we're really bad on our side because we don't say we just got one problem for you. We have, you know, we said we got 15 problems and we've only gotten to the 10th one and the person's already out the door. Uh, so I think that, um, we don't need to talk to COVID to be having people move on the post-COVID agenda. They're there at hello. Nobody missed COVID. Um, so they want to know what to do about it. Like, how can we get our kids caught up? How can we have our kids mentally healthy? I mean, people are just horrified by the numbers. They're horrified by the number of teens, particularly teen girls that contemplate suicide. They're horrified that kids can't read. They're, hor they're horrified by the whole thing. And it's like, I, want, I don't want to talk about the device that passed. I want to go forward together. And who doesn't like individualized learning plans? Everybody likes that. Yeah, it was one of the, it was actually a hunt focus group about two years ago. I still remember a, a, a parent, young parent, uh, female saying, I want to go back to normal, but I want a new normal. And so let's talk about what that, because folks weren't that happy about the way education was moving pre-COVID. Uh, and now we've been through this pandemic. Now we've had this disruption. And so what's the new normal that can come out of this? And so that, that's important. Second thing is I do want to just touch on quickly, we're, as you mentioned, Lucy, we're coming to the end of the expenditure of ESSER dollars, probably the single greatest federal expenditure made in behalf of education that the public is largely unaware of. Uh, and so what, what that means is though, in with most of those ESSER dollars probably being committed, uh, by, by districts. What I would urge district leaders to be doing is to be saying, okay, what's working in my district that we wanna be able to continue when we go back to normal funding streams. But the other part of it is where are there districts and states that have made real, really turned things around, busted silos, created community schools, created education opportunities that didn't exist before using these ESSER dollars that now They've already done the grunt work, the, the basic uh, uh, alpha testing, beta testing. What is it that now, but now with the, as we return to existing federal and state streams of money, what is it that we can learn from others that we can employ? If we get anything uh, positive out of this, this pandemic, it has been that we've been totally disrupted and many folks had to do things differently. Not all of it worked and some of it actually leads to improvement and we need to learn from that. That's how we get the maximum investment uh, from what taxpayers in the Congress and the uh, president approved. Uh, and, and now we'll be coming to an end in September of 2024. And Governor, uh, to your point, we need to be able to talk about what worked. Yes. And so we can make the case uh, for what we need to do either at the state level or the federal level moving forward. And that's what we're trying to do here in the state is to have evaluation for all our investments. So we can talk about what worked uh, in a way that I think the public also appreciates how we're investing and the results that we're getting from that. And, and you're so key about not going back to the way things were. And that's why our message, which families tell us they're looking for, for positive messaging, uh, is that we want to go back to exceed the pre-pandemic levels. Now, nobody really wants to go back to where we were. Uh, and that is really important. So every time we invest in a program, what's working, what's happening, and letting folks know why, 
I know you've got some enrichment programs or after school programs. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Are they the traditional programs or are we augmenting them and why? And I think families and our communities, in fact, our educators as well, respond very positively to that. So keep the lines of communication open and positive message, messaging across all our stakeholder groups. Really important that we, we can't do this in isolation. And I always said, and schools cannot do this alone. Uh, what is our states, right? As we think about putting all our supports around, all our, our staff, all our educators, uh, all our students, uh, this is what we need to be doing and doing it together. And this is a window of opportunity to do that. One thing that's very strong too, Commissioner, you're reminding me of, it's very, very strong. And, and the other side, the wedge side tends to have this more than we do, to say we joined together and we got this accomplished. Um, people aren't sure they can make a difference. People particularly who don't have kids in school who are very committed to schools, um, you know, wouldn't, don't want to intervene because they think they make things worse, not better. Um, you know, I got a poll once that asked me, did I, and we did one for Hunt, did I want to have the budget for the school? I've never voted against the school levy in my entire life. I don't want the budget for the school. I have no idea what things are supposed to cost. Um, and I don't want to mess it up. So I think that showing where people came together and made a difference. And then the other thing I just want to underscore, it isn't even a rejection that education was so bad that people don't want to look at the old bad. People, America, the, the strongest word in advertising in America right now is you. The second strongest word is new. We would never sell in America the Tide your mother used. You wouldn't sell a box of that. Tide would go under in a week. Tide sells you the new Tide, the gel Tide, the pod Tide, the purple Tide. Americans always want to improve and do better. They, that's where they get hope. And right now they're really upset because they think nothing is getting better. Well, education is a place we can join together and make it better. And we can change the tide too. Yes, yes, <laughs> very good. Amazing. Um, that brings us just about to the hour. Thank all three of you for being with us Thank today for this you. conversation. This is every year when these results come out, I think it's fascinating. So really appreciate y'all doing this deep dive with us, helping us work through them. Um, really appreciate your partnership uh, moving forward and at all times. Uh, before closing our conversation today, I did want to let everyone know about our next homeroom webinar uh, from Plates to Grades, How School Nutrition Fuels Academic Excellence. Uh, coming up on October 19th. So the link to register for that is in the chat. We hope you'll join us. Um, and the homeroom series is not our only webinar series here at the Hunt Institute. We have several. Uh, so we have uh, some additional uh, webinars coming up that you can check out on our website uh, that is dropped down in the chat as well. These are our next ones for our homeroom series that will be specifically focused on K-12. So we also hope you'll join us for these in particular. Um, but with that, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you.